This is lecture six, and today we're going to talk about the competition that existed between the colonial powers uh, in the Americas and trying to acquire more and more land. Um, the uh, essential question, or the, es the essential statement, is that we're going to talk about is we're going to analyze the causes and the consequences of European competition in Americas. Uh, in the Americas, which corresponds with key concept 2.2a through b uh, in the AP guide. So, what exactly is the source of this competition? Now, it's no secret that uh, that these European powers—Spain, France, England, uh, Holland—these uh, these countries had been at war for centuries, um, and uh, and though the warfare in Europe at that time was pretty epic. So, uh, but now this warfare is taking place on a global scale because of the Colombian exchange and the shifting of these empires uh, west into the Americas and even into the Pacific. Uh, these conflicts are going to take place over a global span, which changes the nature of warfare when you really stop and think about it. Um, Instead of defending a predefined uh, territory, your nation, uh, and moving into another nation, now what we're doing is we're competing for resources. So, where was what was the source of this conflict uh, between European um, between these European empires? Well, as time was going by, uh, there was actually less and less resources to access, uh, and there were more and more people. Uh, that needed these resources. Europe was undergoing a population explosion as a result of the Colombian exchange. Uh, there were more people in Europe demanding more of these resources. Um, Europeans in the New World, uh, their populations were expanding as well, especially the English possessions. Uh, population was, was booming. Um, in the meantime, uh, so many of the resources, like arable farmland to, to, for producing tobacco and for producing wheat and other, um, and other crops, were starting to get, get played out. Um, uh, there, there was a huge demand to expand their uh, farming and agriculture westward uh, into Native American lands. Um, competition for, for the fur trade, of course. Our little friend here, the beaver, was being uh, hunted to extinction. Uh, there were fewer and fewer of them. Uh, but the bitter irony of this is that the fewer beavers there were, the more valuable their pelts were, uh, the more engaged uh, countries like France, and then even later England, uh, is going to be in getting these beaver pelts. Sorry, little buddy. Um, so, this is part of it. So, the, this, uh, this economic, uh, you know, uh, requirement for, uh, um, you know, source of this particular conflict, growing populations, growing demand, uh, and shrinking resources. Um, also, too, you know, when we started, when we think about these uh, Native American groups that existed in the Americas at this time, uh, we really have to take a look at these as, as sophisticated poli political actors. They were not backwards people, as, as we've talked about in earlier lectures. Um, they had established trade with Europeans. They were using trade goods that only came from Europe. They understood that many of the things that they were getting from Europeans, uh, things like uh, iron-based tools and, um, and woven fabrics, things along those lines, were things that they themselves could not produce. Uh, they were dependent upon. Uh, European commerce for, for some of these goods that they wanted to have. We start seeing these Native American tribes starting to, uh, to live very differently. Instead of the lo traditional longhouses, the Iroquois, for instance, we start to see uh, many of these tribes uh, building log cabins in a European fashion, wearing European-style clothing. Um, and so these, uh, these cultures were fairly sophisticated. They wanted to maintain their trade relations, and, but at the same time, they also wanted to provide uh, insulation from, especially English, um, uh, English uh, incursions into their territories. Um, so they formed alliances with other European societies and other European countries. Some of uh, Native Americans allied with the English, while others allied with the French. Um, and, of course, politically, just like any other political unit, they would play two sides against each other uh, to their advantage. Also, uh, as we're going to see in just a moment, many of these conflicts were simply holdovers from already existing European conflicts. Uh, there were, 
There were uh, centuries worth of bitterness between uh, our top three rivals, right? Uh, Spain, France, uh, and England. I mean, England and France had fought a hundred years war against each other, uh, you know, previous to this. These guys didn't necessarily get along very well. The Spanish Armada had tried to take down uh, uh, you know, England. Hey, well, these, guys, these guys had some conflicts. Some of these conflicts were based on politics. Some of them were based on religion. Some of them, as you're going to see, are going to be based on orders of secession where the, uh, the monarchies are all intermarried and all competing for access to the crown and the thrones of, of particular countries. So, if, if England is at war with somebody, then England's colonies are going to be at war with the country as well. And if England is at war with France, as was often the case, then English colonists were oftentimes going to be at war with French colonists uh, because that's how the process worked. Again, these, these conflicts are going to become global in nature. But we're going to focus, again, on North America. All right, uh, let's, let's get rid of the Dutch first of all. Uh, you know, so, uh, so the first thing that we're going to deal with is uh, conflicts between England and Holland. As you know from an earlier lecture, um, Holland had, uh, had established colonies along the Hudson River. Uh, this, uh, this colony of New Amsterdam was pretty much the resupply place for, uh, the, for Holland's uh, other colonies in the Caribbean and elsewhere in the Americas. It was pretty much the central hub of all of those other colonies. Um, a, uh, of course, India, I'm sorry, a Dutch had its own um, joint stock company that had a monopoly on, the, uh, on what they referred to as the West Indies, which is, you know, the Americas, North America, especially the Caribbean. Um, and um, and this, uh, this colony was centered around New Amsterdam. Well, um, conflicts arose between the British and the Dutch. Uh, they were both uh, competing for access to Atlantic uh, Ocean trade routes. Um, and to consolidate, England was interested in consolidating its, uh, its colonies on the east coast of, uh, of North America. Uh, this is going to involve three, what we would call Anglo-Dutch wars. All of these wars were largely inconclusive, but, um, you know, the result of this was, especially for the Dutch, uh, if you have a business like the uh, Dutch West India Company, you, you need people to invest in that business, and when you are constantly at a state of war, and these wars are ending inconclusively, um, which means that you're likely to end up in another war within short order, of course. Uh, the war ends in, in 1654. Ten years later, we're in another war. Uh, five years after that, we're in another war. Well, what's going to happen in the next five years? Your investors start to get a little shaky. They're no longer willing to invest in your company. And ultimately, the Dutch West India Company will go bankrupt. Um, and once the Dutch West India Company goes bankrupt, there's no longer a reason uh, to hold... Uh, the, their territory in New Amsterdam, it was no longer a profitable endeavor. Uh, New Amsterdam will be turned over to the English. Um, it will be turned over to uh, Charles II's brother. Pretty nice uh, to have those connections. Um, his brother James was known as the Duke of York. Consequently, New Amsterdam will get the name New York. Um, and later, a section of New York will, uh, will splinter off. The Delaware Valley will splinter off and become New Jersey. Uh, England also spent a lot of time at war with Spain. In fact, uh, what we're going to see is that Spain and France will oftentimes ally with each other uh, against England. England was this rising power. It was kind of scary to other Europeans, especially established powers like Spain and France. So oftentimes they would ally to, uh, to, uh, with each other to take out the English. It never really worked very well. Um, an example of this is, is going to be Queen Anne's War, which we'll talk about a little bit more in depth in just a minute. Um, but one of the things that England was able to... Uh, the Queen Anne's War was primarily between England and France, but Spain had allied itself with France. So uh, as a result of Queen Anne's War and to negotiate the end of the war, uh, Spain allowed England something that was interesting in a mercantilist uh, situation. Spain was... Uh, England was given the right to go into Spanish ports and sell English goods in Spanish ports. Uh, 
um, up to 500 tons of goods. Um, after that, they were no longer allowed to sell. They could also sell an unlimited number of slaves. So this was really great uh, for the English. This, this opened up vast new markets for the English. Um, but it also created a situation in which the Spanish had to figure out a way to make sure that the English were only selling 500 tons of goods, uh, you know, in these ports. It becomes kind of an enforcement problem. It was put on the Spanish Navy to enforce this particular rule. Well, um, during this time, a fellow by the name of Captain Robert Jenkins, he was a merchant uh, sailor. Uh, was asked to testify before Parliament. There was a tremendous amount of pressure on Parliament to um, to go to war against uh, against Spain. Um, you know, it, over these competitive reasons, um, the uh, the Prime Minister at the time was a guy by the name of Robert Walpole. He was not interested in going to war. He did not want to spend an awful lot of money on a war with Spain, and he was trying to keep everything down. But this guy, Captain Robert Jenkins, uh, walks into uh, Parliament, and he uh, and it's he's conspicuously missing an ear. Uh, and uh, he was asked to sit down and testify as to his experiences with the Spanish Navy and his experiences with the Spanish Navy uh, he was able to summarize in a little box. He produces this little box, yanks out this dried, shriveled up ear that used to be connected to his head and informs the Parliament that, uh, that just to spite him, the Spanish captain uh, cut off his ear. Uh, and of course the British were appalled that this could happen to a British citizen uh, they clamored for war. Uh, they did end up going to war with Spain. This becomes known as uh, the War of Jenkins' Ear. Um, you know, during this time, it was a largely inconclusive war. Uh, our friend here, uh, James Oglethorpe, one of the founders of the colony of Georgia, uh, took his uh, took a militia of uh, you know of his debtors down to uh, down into Florida to attack. Uh, uh, to attack uh, the Spanish colonies in Florida. Um, at the same time, of course, the Spanish military was, uh, was driving its way into Georgia and had been repulsed by the time it got to Savannah. Uh, largely, these, uh, these attacks were inconclusive. Uh, the War of Jenkins' Ear was mostly a stalemate. The, uh, a settlement was negotiated and uh, uh, not to anybody's particular advantage. England versus France. Now, during this time, of course, uh, France, uh, there's a great deal of uh, pressure uh, in England to move westward to, to get the, especially to get that really wonderful uh, agricultural fields that, are, that exist in the nor what became the Northwest Territories, Ohio. Um, especially that Ohio Valley was prime uh, real estate, but it, it belonged to the French. Um, also, in this, in, enter into this mix Native American groups. Um, the uh, Iroquois nations are going to form an alliance with the English. This will be called the Covenant Chain. Uh, the, um, the covenant uh, between the, uh, the English and the Iroquois. That they, would, um, that they would support each other in this particular region. Uh, of course, the great competitors for the Iroquois were the Algonquin, uh, who had allied themselves with the French. Um, also at this time, the British had decided to get into the fur trade. Our, our beaver friend is in big trouble. This was the Hudson Bay Company. Uh, and the Hudson Bay Company, the goal was to find fur hunting grounds, beaver hunting grounds, in which to participate in the fur trade, the growing uh, lucrative fur trade. At the same time, some of the uh, things that are happening, there's a tremendous amount of conflict between England and France in Europe itself. Go figure. Um, so among these conflicts, we have uh, the War of the League of Augsburg. Yeah, a relatively minor war as far as Europe is concerned. Uh, a fairly major deal uh, in the Americas. Uh, this became known as King William's War, in which uh, yeah, French and Algonquin uh, tribes uh, are going to attack and go up against English and Iroquois tribes as kind of a precursor to the French and Indian War that will happen later on. Uh, this war will largely be inconclusive. Um, many English uh, settlements 
are going to be uh, going to be burned down. Some French settlements are going to be burned down. There's going to be an attempt to take out the French central uh, colony at Quebec. That'll that'll be a failure. Uh, Montreal will be taken and then given back. It, it was just a mess. Um, ultimately, too, uh, after this, we have a two wars that had to do with royal succession. Um, which uh, king or queen would hold the throne in Spain and then ultimately Austria. And uh, you got to understand that Spain and Austria were part of the same empire, the part of the same dynasty, the Habsburg dynasty. Uh, so in, uh, in Europe, what was the war of, of Spanish succession? In the Americas, became known as Queen Anne's War. Again, uh, England versus France and Spain. We, we covered this a little bit earlier. Um, during this time, uh, a, a military contingent from South Carolina will actually go into Florida, actually um, chasing down fugitive slaves who had escaped uh, and headed south into Florida, uh, joined with some, uh, some of the Native American tribes, some, uh, maybe we'll call them Seminole tribes uh, in Florida, and, um, and you know, we're, we're living their lives. Uh, many of them were seeking refuge in, in St. Augustine. Uh, these South Carolinians went down, actually attacked and, and, and burned, uh, late siege and burned St. Augustine. Um, again, the uh, Queen Anne's War, largely, uh, largely undecided. Uh, it did establish the, the, the border between Florida and Georgia, the same border that exists even today. Uh, that came out of uh, Queen Anne's War. Um, also, we have the War of the Austrian Succession, which in the Americas was known as King George's War. Uh, again, this is going to be a war uh, between England and, I say Spain, it should actually be France. Um, and this will be fought mostly to a stalemate as well. Um, now, all of these wars were relatively inconclusive. Um, but for England, that actually wasn't a bad deal. You got to understand that France and Spain were already established powers, and England was kind of an up and comer. Um, the fact that England could fight uh, France and Spain, and oftentimes combined uh, French and Spanish forces uh, to a stalemate, actually looked pretty good for, for England. Some of the consequences of these wars uh, included. Uh, increased military preparedness in the colonies. The colonies now understood that at any given time they could be called upon uh, to get involved in the wars of their mother country. Uh, in the English colonies, that, in, that meant uh, the presence of, a, of the regular British army. It also meant that, um, that many American males are going to be incorporated into militias. They're going to be expected to uh, participate uh, in militias when they achieve a certain age and be prepared for combat with either European forces or with Native American forces. Um, we also see that, uh, that as far as the, the colonies are concerned, um, the, um, the King of England is going to just make the decision of saying, hey, you know what, I'm paying basically to protect all of these colonies. Uh, maybe it's a good idea to just make, make them all royal colonies. So you have all of these, these proprietary colonies and these, uh, these corporate colonies. Um, and what will ultimately happen is we're going to just make them all royal colonies. And for the most part, um, you know, these colonies that had at one time been uh, run by companies or by individuals, um, well, British governors are going to be sent in, English governors are going to be sent in to run these, uh, these colonies for the sake of the king. Um, of the uh, original 13 colonies, oops, of the original 13 colonies, um, there we go, of the original 13 colonies, the uh, Pennsylvania will retain its proprietorship, uh, William Penn will remain the proprietor of, um, of Pennsylvania, um, and the um, the only, co the only colonies that will actually maintain its government are going to be Rhode Island and Connecticut. Uh, they, will, they will keep their, uh, their government and they will not necessarily be ruled by a royal governor. Um, this is going to be really significant, especially as we get into the, into the revolutionary uh, period where we start to see the King of England uh, trying to you know, uh, wrest more control and, and gain more control over these territories.
Um, tightening control over the colonies. Uh, you know, these, uh, if we're going to spend more to defend these colonies, we want more in return. So we're going to see uh, increased taxes. We're going to see uh, more and more things put on a list of enumeration. Um, and we also see persisting animosities among uh, European uh, colonists in the New World. Got to understand, some of these European colonists had never even been to Europe. Um, many of them were, you know, lived in North America their whole lives. And in fact, by, uh, by the 18th century, there were folks living in the Americas whose, whose grandparents uh, had come to, uh, to the Americas to settle. So many of these folks had never actually been to Europe, but still retained these European uh, ideals, European identities. Uh, American colonists understood themselves to be part of the British Empire. French colonists understood themselves to be part of the French Empire. And even though we can make the argument that, um, that American uh, colonists uh, were separated from the politics of Europe, Many of these folks didn't feel that way. They felt that a slight to their mother country was a slight unto them. Uh, so these persisting animosities are going, to, uh, are going to remain in the colonies and are going to be a, a factor in shaping um, the history of these particular, uh, these particular uh, uh, country, these colonies. So, um, that's it in a nutshell. Until next, uh, next lecture.